2016 der blev Bob Dylan tildelt Nobelprisen i litteratur. Det var en verdenssensation. Det vagte stor diskussion. Jeg var rigtig glad, fordi jeg har igennem mange år indstillet Bob Dylan til Nobelprisen i litteratur, og nu skete det. Og den dag, den 13. oktober 2016, der lovede jeg mig selv to ting. At jeg for det første ville skrive en bog om Bob Dylans dækning, og at jeg for det andet ville indbyde til en stor international konference her på Syddansk Universitet. Og ja, nu er vi her. Bogen er udkommet, og gæsterne til konferencen er på vej hertil. De har, vi har sat dem stævne her på Syddansk Universitet, og vi skal møde nogle af dem her i det gamle adelige jomfrukloster i centrum af Odense. Og en af dem, vi skal møde, det er professor Sean Latham, som kommer fra Tulsa University. Og øh, han er leder af et institut for Bob Dylans studier, som er åbnet i Tulsa. Det er nemlig sådan, at man der også har fået en stor gave. Man har fået alle øh, arkivalier, der er tilgængelige omkring Bob Dylan, har man erhvervet sig, og de findes nu i Tulsa. Og øh, Sean Latham er i gang med at studere det hele, og vi skal tale med ham om arkivet og hans arbejde. John Latham, it's such a pleasure to welcome you here in Odense. Thank you for coming. Sure, it's nice to be here. You're a professor of literature at the Tulsa University, and you're also the director of the Institute for Bob Dylan Studies at Tulsa University. What kind of uh, institution is this Bob Dylan Institute? Well, among other things, we're brand new, so we've only been in existence for about a year. We were announced just after we announced that the University of Tulsa and the George Kaiser Family Foundation had acquired the Bob Dylan Archive uh, and that it would be moving to Tulsa. Uh, so really we form part of what we think of now as a three-cornered stool. So the archive itself, which contains over 100,000 objects, uh, is lodged at a museum that the university manages uh, and which can care properly for all of the material that's in the archive. Uh, and then there's a Bob Dylan Center, which is being built in Tulsa. It's going to be a standalone sort of museum. It'll be the place that the public can most easily access Bob Dylan's archive and materials. And then we're the research arm of all of this. So we're going to oversee things like the publication of articles and journals and books and direct research as it goes into the archive. So we're, we're about making, trying to figure out the story of Bob Dylan using this incredible collection of materials. Yeah, we heard that this is an incredible collection of items <laughs> and it, uh, that it extends the most uh, wild expectations yes. of the Dylan researchers. Uh, could you tell us in what way? Uh, I mean, I think the sheer scope of it, I mean, even uh, we just updated our, our website because we've been using a number of, I think, about 15,000 objects. And now that we actually have everything uh, that's a part of the original acquisition in Tulsa, the number now exceeds 100,000. Um, And this includes almost anything you could imagine. It turns out Dylan was an incredible pack rat. Uh, and so we've got the things that all archives have. We have letters, we have drafts of the manuscripts, we have many, many little tiny notebooks that Dylan always seemed to carry around with him and his guitar cases and other things. And then we have every studio outtake tape, um, every stem, so every, every microphone that was picking up something at a recording session. We have all of that material, all of the film scripts uh, and and rough cuts for all the films that Dylan did, so tons of unseen film footage um, from the movies, uh, as well as drafts for the, the books that he published, things like Chronicles and um, uh, Tarantula. We have a, an enormous collection of Tarantula manuscripts. It's, uh, it's nearly anything and everything you could think. Oh, and uh, photographs, we have thousands of contact sheets with photographs um, from Dylan from the earliest days right up to his most recent releases. What have surprised you the most of all these, uh, this material? Well, I mean, I, in some ways, I'm, I can't, I don't think anybody can quite answer that question because of the scope of the archive. Like, no one's seen it all yet um, yeah. in order to get a sense of what actually is there. So 
uh, as I've sort of uh, started to work into the archive, I've been paying particular attention to those notebooks. Um, they provide this sort of undated but daily record of Dylan's thoughts and writings and ideas and song lyrics and measurements for curtains, um, all kinds of things uh, find their way into these notebooks. And so I've been going through those, um, especially looking at the years from 1967 to 1968. Uh, and I think the thing that stands out the most is just how hard a worker Dylan was. So there's, there's long been a myth of Dylan that he sort of just would sit down and write these songs. They would pop out of his head. He, he fed this myth in some ways too. But now that as we look at the drafts of the lyrics, the notebooks, the typescripts, the handwritten corrections, Dylan worked these songs over and over and over again before they ever made their way onto an album. Um, so I'd say the single most surprising thing is just how hard a worker Dylan is at these songs. And, and, and we now have this extraordinary ability to trace his creativity from the first few words of a lyric or a chorus that made their way into his mind to see how that would then grow into a complete song on the other end. So we have the possibility of learning uh, much more about his creativity and his process and yeah, you said yeah. how hard a worker he is on his songs, yeah. how long it takes. And how his process has changed over the years. I mean, I think that's an interesting thing okay. too, where some, you know, in some cases he did start with, he did some, clearly just pound some of these songs out, make some quick corrections and perform them on stage. Other songs clearly took a long time to gestate. And other songs like Tangled Up in Blue, which Dylan himself has famously transformed over the course of his career over many performances, he's still at work on. So we, we still receive occasionally updated note, uh, note sheets with lyrics that he's now altered a word or two or changed a bit. So that process has changed over the course of his career too. He's clearly not just one way of writing songs, he experiments broadly. He experiments with his songs still and find new interpretations and in changing the words a yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. And then updates the copyright files, which we, which we now have. Yeah, in yeah. Tulsa. Yeah, it's amazing oh, to see. So interesting. Yeah. And uh, you just told me that you actually came across uh, the name of our capital Copenhagen <laughs> yeah. uh, in uh, one of the, the on one of the sheets. Could you tell me a little bit yeah, more about that? I wish I could tell you more, other than to say I was flipping through the notebook, sort of knowing I would be coming here, uh, and uh, came across a page that's just labeled Copenhagen, uh, and seems to have what must be some phone numbers. Uh, written down on it, but that's that's all I can say. And it dates from, we, I'm, I'm pretty sure the notebooks in themselves don't have dates from Dylan on them, but I'm sure the notebook dates from 1964. Um, he seems to have carried it most likely in his guitar case over the course of a year, because it it's clearly travels the globe. It's got numbers in Paris and numbers in California and New York and uh, uh, street names and city names that he comes across in Louisiana and Texas. Um, so it goes everywhere with him. And yeah, Copenhagen is just sitting there. We don't. We were saying, I don't, I don't think he visited Copenhagen during that period, but maybe he did, we just don't know. Yeah, he was in Europe uh, during uh, that yeah. period, so he, he might have been here without any of us yeah. knowing. <laughs> <laughs> we, what we know exactly is that he, he gave his first concert here in uh, 66, and uh, that was a great success, and uh, he uh, visited the, the castle of Kronborg. But perhaps, perhaps he actually was here in 66. We better check that yeah. phone number. <laughs> we need to look at those numbers and figure out who they were. <laughs> You're working on a book on Bob Dylan right now. Yes. What kind of book? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a biography of Dylan. Um, in some ways, the archive allows us to rethink Dylan's biography in fundamentally new ways. We just have access to materials that no biographer would have had before. And my book's called Bob Dylan's Odyssey, uh, and it's really a biography of Dylan's creative life. So I'm much less interested in sort of doing the work that some great biographers like Clinton Halen have already done that sort of show where Dylan was day by day, almost hour by hour sometimes in, in Halen's recounting. And I'm much more interested, as I said, in that creative process. So what do we know about how Dylan's process changed over the course of his life? And the, the underlying argument of the book is one of the things that makes Dylan truly great and I, and I think worthy of winning things like the Nobel Prize is that over the course of his songwriting, he learns how to become a terrific storyteller. Not just a lyricist, not, not a poet, not just a songwriter, but to tell fantastic stories and so this book tracks the ways in which he learned different parts of storytelling how to create characters plots settings and and now in his late music about how to bring things to an end um, this uh, knowledge of uh, narratives uh, where did, from where did that come it, it's just i was trying to it's one of those things where i wanted to know what makes dylan interesting to me uh, and i've always been someone that likes stories that tell songs and uh, as i as i've listened to dylan I, i'm I'm certainly taken with and understand some of the surrealistic experimental lyrics and uh, 
of his work, but it's the songs that have stories embedded with them or that invite storytelling by having sort of fragments of characters and people and events. Those songs call out to me. And so I wanted to get a sense of, of, of Dylan as a storyteller. And, and you see, he's, he's interested in making, throughout his career, he's been interested in, in movies and in telling stories through other kinds of media. Uh, when he published Chronicles, a sort of recounting of a piece of his life, mm -hmm. you know, I think that, that book is a masterpiece of storytelling itself. And even his Nobel acceptance speech, uh, is, a, is a piece of storytelling about the stories that have mattered to him. And they weren't poems, really. They were, they were narratives that mattered to Dylan. Yeah, yeah, we tend to focus on Dylan the poet, yeah. uh, as I myself <laughs> do. And, uh, but you're right. Uh, his, um, uh, some of, a lot of his songs tell stories. Uh, and they have this uh, strong narrative uh, uh, awareness uh, in them. So that'll be very interesting. And when we talk of narratives, uh, we often think of uh, perhaps um, fairy tales and his inspiration yes. from fairy tales. Uh, do you think he's also inspired by the Grimm uh, brothers, the German uh, storytellers uh, Grimm? Oh, that's a good question. I, you know, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I think he is interested in, 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 in stories like that. I mean, I, I think the Bible is really the source of a lot of Dylan's interest in, in storytelling, both, both the New and Old Testament. He's interested in sort of narratives of prophecy, um, and then uh, the parables from the New Testament. I think he's interested in stories that, that don't unwrap themselves easily or naturally. So they're, they're stories to me that always invite more storytelling. So when you, when you listen to some of these songs and talk to other people about them, you're sort of having to invent a story to wrap those lyrics, to wrap around those lyrics, to make them make sense, and uh, just as we do with biblical commentary of all kinds, uh, you know. I th so something similar might be there with, with Grimm's fairy tales as well, in the sense that they invite, like they're not just this story, right? They've got this other level of interpretation that's yeah. always around them. I tried to figure out whether he uh, quotes Hans Christian Andersen <laughs> uh, anywhere, and I, I think he might do it in the Desolation Row. Oh, and, yeah? Uh, yeah, because there's a stanza there that he, he seldom includes it in his performances. Uh, that's a, a stanza about the lovely mermaids. Oh, yeah. Uh, they, they look out through the Titanic window and they see where lovely mermaids flow. And that reminds us uh, immediately of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale of the little mermaid. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't think he has ever been perhaps aware of this. It, but it must have been there somewhere in his language, his world, this uh, idea of mermaids. Yeah, I mean, Anderson is one of those figures whose stories just percolate through all of world culture, right? I mean, everybody sort of knows something about the ugly duckling or the little yeah, mermaid, yeah. Uh, the princess and the pea. So yeah. these things, and Dylan loves to work from those kind of folk resources. So you know, Dylan reads broadly and deeply, his, his notebooks and other things make that very clear. Um, but his reading is also incredibly eclectic. Uh, and I think he's very interested in particular about stories that sort of live I guess I would say sort of on the ground, like around other people. So he, he certainly reads and thinks about people like T.S. Eliot and James Joyce, but I'm sure he'd be just as interested in, in fairy tales and, and other popular forms. I mean, we know he does that musically, just his interest in the Southern blues, in American folk tales and folk music. That's, that's always been a, a wellspring of inspiration, I think, for Dylan in his writing. Um, uh, when uh, Dylan received his Nobel Prize, uh, Horace Engdale uh, compared uh, Dylan to Hans Christian Andersen and said what brings about the great shift in world literature is when somebody combines uh, the folk tradition and uh, make with, with, uh, with poetry, with art. Uh, what do you think of this? Is, is, this, is that right? No, absolutely. I think it's completely convincing to me. Um, we certainly know that happened with, with Anderson. Uh, I actually was just at the Hans Christian Anderson Museum today, so I had a chance okay. to sort of peruse, I mean, just to think about the ways that these small stories, um, you know, from this part of the world radiated out into all of world culture and still affect every single part of it um, is extraordinary. And I think you see a similar process at work with Dylan. Uh, you think about things like the Southern blues uh, and American folk music, these are relatively obscure. Un until the 1960s, until Dylan got his hands on them, they were relatively obscure um, resources. And now Dylan has made them into the sort of world idiom of what we would think of as rock music and pop music uh, more generally. Uh, 
Dylan certainly wasn't alone in that. Uh, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles uh, also played a role, but Dylan was part of that small group of people that found in this obscure American folk musical tradition something that has utterly transformed the way we think about world music. You're here to participate in the conference and you're going to yeah. speak uh, and uh, uh, present a paper. Yeah. What is your topic? What is the topic of your paper? So I've long had an interest in magazines. I've, I've, uh, I'm a scholar of, of, of magazines in particular and I'm very, and magazines, as, at least until quite recently, magazines were really the lifeblood of culture. Um, they were readily accessible, they could be widely distributed. Before we had hundreds of cable channels, magazines were the way that you could connect with all kinds of communities and fan bases. So I'm very interested in the ways in which um, Dylan's career took shape in and around magazines. They clearly mattered to him a lot. Growing up in Hibbing, these would have been his only sort of way of keeping in touch with, an, with the outside world. Um, and things like Life Magazine and Newsweek Magazine and Time Magazine, we know he read these intensely and obsessively and worried about his profiles in them. So I'm, the paper I'm gonna present is really about the ways in which the very early, in which Dylan's very early interviews and profiles first appeared in teen magazines in the United States with sometimes funny titles like Ingenue, it was the magazine for the sophisticated teen, uh, in which Dylan was, appear, was sort of cast as a teenage heartthrob, which is not at all how we think about Dylan, but he's surrounded there by other teenage heartthrobs from the era. This is clearly how you would, they thought you would market, uh, market a, a pop star in the early 1960s. Uh, teen set. Uh, movie Week, all of these kind of unlikely teen magazines are the places that Dylan really first got noticed and where he first did interviews and where people first started to make sense of his, uh, of his music. So my paper is going to look in particular at that funny little set of teen magazines where Dylan first appeared, which are very, very difficult to find, it turns out. Um, but I was able to get some help from a collector who, who showed me some of this material. What's an interesting uh, story yeah, uh, you have know? to yeah. tell us? <laughs> this, is this is before Rolling Stone, before yeah. you know, all these rock magazines yeah, yeah, took shape. Yeah. So these magazines were edited by women. Uh, the pieces were usually written by women. Uh, and many of them were directed at a teenage girl uh, audience. So. But it must also has been, been a very difficult uh, position to escape this position as a teen idol. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I mean, he, you know, he, I think he revolted against it pretty quickly. Um, and the Beatles sort of moved in and took over that, like they became the heartthrobs. And so Dylan and the Stones both clearly set themselves up to be different than the Beatles, uh, you know, because uh, the, the, those were the main heartthrobs and the monkeys and, and Sonny and Cher and things like that afterward. But so Dylan was clearly trying to find a space that would be his own that he could occupy in these, in these magazines. What is your favorite Dylan song? <laughs> <laughs> the, it's an impossible question to answer. Um, there's a Dylan song for almost every occasion. Uh, I mean, I, I think A Hard Rain Is Gonna Fall is really the song that, that I would come back to most often. It's the song, of course, that Patti Smith performed at the, at the Nobel uh, ceremony. And it's, it's a song that's about storytelling, um, which I think is why it appeals most to me. So if I had to pick only one, but really, I mean, I, I, you know, I've got 20 that I couldn't live without, I think, from all parts of his, from all parts of his career. I think you share that experience <laughs> with a lot of yeah. people. <laughs> so thank you for talking to me. Of course, and, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Tak til seerne, fordi I kiggede med.